Matt Mutrigoso here, creator of Xenoplicity and the Q system it runs on. Today's video, I want to talk about dimensions of role-playing. Uh, nowadays, this gets called 3D role-playing or 4D role-playing, 2D role-playing, that kind of thing. Um, here's the thing. Um, these, this idea, it's not a new idea, but these are new terms. These are, these are uh, new ways of describing something that's always been around. Uh, I've been in the hobby now for 30 years, playing weekly for 30 years. So it's not that I started a long time ago and then came back to it years later. No, I've been active in the hobby for a long time. And only recently, like in the last year, have I heard the term 4D role-playing even come up. So I want to talk about this because um, for many of us that have been in the hobby a long time, we think it's kind of weird and we're scratching our heads going, what are the, what, what are these people even talking about? And, and, and how is this different than the way I've always been role playing? And I got to tell you, most of the times I've played at conventions or the games that I've been a part of in conventions, I have normally seen people role play very well across the board while I'm role playing with strangers. For, to, to what is commonly called 3D role-playing. That is, that is the norm. That is the average from what I've seen in various games. Admittedly, the games that I play at conventions are never D&D &D games. They're never D20 class level-based games. So maybe, um, and I think I think the reality is, is that if you are playing a uh, class-based, level-based D20 game, chances are what you're used to seeing at the table is 2D role-playing. And, um, and, and I think there are reasons for that. I think it's because fundamentally D and D and, uh, and games like fantasy trip, which you see back here on my shelf, um, these are, um, games that lend themselves to a two dimensional style of role play. They, they are essentially board games. As a, as a matter of fact, depending on the edition you're using, depending on the rules that you're using, you may not even have a movement allowance, um, outside of spaces on a board. Right, that may be how your movement is even defined is spaces. Um, Matt Coville's new game that's generating a ton of buzz and has a lot of following and a lot of money getting poured into it. They've already came out and announced a long time ago that they're not going to have um, like a, a distance for movement. They're going to have spaces on a board for movement because they want to have a map and a grid. They they want to have minis, right? So if your game is a board with minis on it, you are essentially playing a board game. It doesn't mean you can't role play it. It doesn't mean it can't still be fun. It doesn't mean that that those games don't have merit. Fantasy Trip, like I said back here, this is one of my favorite games. But it is essentially a, a board game with with role play aspects tied into it because you're moving a piece around a board and then you're rolling dice accordingly and it's fundamentally a board game guys um and again i don't i don't say that in a negative way i'm not saying that to be disrespectful there's a time and a place for that there are there are some nights where um there's nothing more than i want than to play a fantasy trip dungeon um but it is what it is that that, that you're not going to get the same level of narration and role play out of that game uh, than you are a skill-based game system like shadow run or vampire the masquerade um or exalted right or zweihander or you know fantasy warhammer fantasy these are games that lend themselves more towards uh, a narrative free-flowing game um you know collaborative storytelling call of cthulhu is another good example um, i just think that these games are better suited for or what you're going for in a 3D role-playing session. So let's go ahead and define what we're talking about when we talk about 1D, 2D, 3D, 4, um, one-dimensional role-player, 1D role-playing. This is where you essentially are just there for the fun. You're just there for the social interaction. You're just there to hang out with friends, a beer and pretzels, soda, soft drinks, pizza, right? You're, you're, you're going to talk across the table. You're going to make jokes. You're going to quote movies you're not really going to be paying much attention to the game itself you're mostly there for the the social interaction with the other players at the table and the thing about one dimensional role playing is that often is the case that this this type of player is going to be more of an audience member in the game they're going to be sitting back they're not going to be playing and uh, taking much of an active role um very passive it doesn't mean they can't still have good ideas it doesn't mean they can't still play their character and 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 do a fine job but their focus really is not so much on the game itself but on the activity of gaming right of just having fun with your friends two-dimensional role-playing this is essentially a board game mentality a really focused board game mentality this is you focused on the game you're focused on the rules you're focused on um you know the the the, the mechanics the dice rolling these are all things that you're jazzed about you're excited about you're really engaged with 
but you're not always going to be talking in character. As a matter of fact, most of your conversation, the majority of it, right, um, you know, 51% or more of it will be done out of character. Uh, if you have a question in the game, can I do this? May I do that? Is going to be uh, very much like the, the interaction you have with the game master. Chances are the majority of your interaction is actually with the players, not the characters. So what I mean by that is, is player character walks into a room, a two-dimensional way of role-playing is to look around and say, are there any rocks around? Can I see any rocks? Right? This is the player asking the game master this outside of the game. There's there's a conversation happening across the table between players. This has nothing to do with what's happening in the game, um, but the player wants to know if there are rocks around for them to interact with. Okay, so this this would be a two dimensional style of play. Three dimensional style of play means that you're in character the majority, if not all the time. Uh, if you have a question about something in the setting, in the game, in the fiction, then you ask it, but you ask it in a way where you can either ask an NPC that question in the game, or you are directing your, your inquiry in a way where the game master can acknowledge or answer it without there being any across the table conversation. So in this particular case, player character walks into the room and the player says, I'm looking around for some rocks. Um, I'm looking for rocks to, to interact with. I, I'm really looking for something to pick up and throw like a, a big, large rock. Okay. And then they pause, they wait. And the game master then responds of, yeah, sure. Absolutely. There's a rock there or no, there's not a rock there. Um, and so the, the, the question, the same question is being asked, but instead of asking it from player to game master, the player is actually narrating their character, looking for it in the fiction. And then the game master can clarify whether or not there is said rock in the area for them to interact with, for them to, to then proceed with narrating what they're going to do with it. The interaction is actually happening in character, in the fiction, as opposed to across the table, out of character, if that makes sense. Um, now, 4D role-playing, this is dual narration. This is co-creating. This is when the players have creative liberty, narrative liberty, to um, not just role-play their player character, but also role-play their surroundings. The general agreement between game master and player is that whatever they're going to do, it has to make narrative sense in the fiction. But beyond that, the game master is going to let the player kind of narrate them for themselves what's around them uh, based on the scenery that's already been described uh, just use common sense use uh, you know what makes narrative sense and then um, the game master will just play off of it so you get a lot of back and forth playing off of each other you know they're bouncing ideas back and forth between game master and player um, and so it creates this uh, joint fiction and and this has some good qualities right the idea of uh, collaborative storytelling really takes center stage with 4d role playing given the rock situation let's look at that same example in 4d player you know, has their character walk in a room and says, I look around for a rock. I see a rock on the ground. I grab it and I'm deciding to throw it across the room. That would be 4D role playing. The player assumes that because there would be rocks in this area, that they can just narrate there being a rock on the ground for them to pick up and then they just throw it. And it is a, it is incumbent on the game master to at any point where the player is overstepping their bounds to then step in and say, whoa, whoa, uh, actually there's not a rock there. Or, um, you know, before you throw it, X, Y, or Z happens. Um, so the, the game master has to kind of reel in this authority, this power that they've, they've allowed the players to have. Problem is, is that the, the issues that come up when you 4D role play are, 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 there's a lot of them. And it's not a new phenomenon. It's, it's always been the case. And, and, and let, me, let me address what they are. Number one is a spectrum um, of narration, right? Some things are okay to add to the narrative. Other things are not right so you're in a you're in a, a scary spooky house there's an axe murder chasing you one player goes into the kitchen runs over and grabs a knife they just find a small little steak knife right they say i find this small little steak knife and i'm going to grab it i'm going to use it as a weapon against this axe wielding murderer cool that's fine right it's a lesser weapon than what the threat is is pursuing them and for a horror game that's important another player runs to the living room and says uh, actually there is an elephant gun hung over the mantle and i'm just going to grab the elephant gun and grab the shells that are with it and i'm going to load it up and that way i can shoot the, the the murderer okay we'll see now you've just broken the whole point of the scenario right it's an axe murder the guy's got an axe if you pull out an elephant gun 
heck, even if you pulled out a, a Derringer or or a, you know just a just a revolver or or a shotgun, any gun is going to trump an axe in the hands of a lunatic. Um, and so, because you've escalated the the narrative in that sense, you've really robbed the whole scene of any tension that it might have. Um, and so, allowing players to be able to just narrate whatever they want and add to the scenery in ways that makes it, I mean, hey, you know what? An old farmhouse, it makes perfect sense for there to be a gun over the mantle. It really does the problem is is that in the given situation um it's actually detrimental to the the whole the whole scenario and the whole theme of what you're going for by having an axe murderer attacking and stalking the group okay um so they would have to find weapons smaller than what the what the axe person has otherwise there's no tension there right you're cool i'll just shoot them i'll just kill them right not a problem um <clears throat> this is an issue and this is the kind of issue that you're going to run into when you do 4D role playing, especially if you're if you're a, a more of a novice game master and you don't have the confidence or the ability to reel in players very quickly and very succinctly when they start to go above and beyond the level of narration you you want them to be able to have. And again, it's such a fine it's walking such a fine line. It's not always clear where the line is, um, and, and you got to be really careful about this. Another example for how 4D role playing can really screw you up. Up. Um, so you're on a starship now in a 4d role-playing session it might be very much the case that there's no floor plan for the ship and so you say well I, the, the players know the rooms that are in the starship so it doesn't really matter the layout it doesn't really matter what the the floor plan looks like of the starship it's it's irrelevant the players can just narrate that for you know themselves okay well again there are certain things that just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to give control to the players in this sense and, and let me give you an example four players all in the bridge problem in the engine room first player says all right i'm going to run down the hallway i turn left and i run into the engine room second player i run down the hallway i turn right i run into the engine room third player i run to the to the, to the ladder and i'm going to slide down the ladder and get to the engine room fourth player i'm going to run to the elevator and go up one floor because the engine room is on the second floor you got four different players all narrating at the same time where they're going, what they're doing. They're all trying to get to the engine room and they're all trying to put their creative spin on it and it's all taking them in different directions. This is very confusing. It doesn't make any sense. How many how many levels are on the ship? Is there a ladder? Is there an elevator? Um, is, is the engine room to the left or to the right of the bridge? Who knows, right? Because you didn't say that this is the concrete floor plan of the ship. And so each player trying to narrate themselves going in the direction that they think makes sense or they think is cool, it ends up creating contradictions in the fiction that break apart the immersion of the world. Okay, there are certain things you as the game master are supposed to set in stone. It is up to you as a game master to set the, to set the rails of the fiction, whether that be what's in the town, whether that be what's on the ship, whether that be you know what's in the general area or region of this world that you're playing on. Whatever the case may be, no matter what game you're playing, the game master has to set certain standards, and then the players can interact with and add to and tweak the scenery and the narration within those set boundaries. But you cannot leave it all up to free form because when you do you get weird kind of anomaly situations that just make it seem silly or weird or strange and things just start to fall apart or unravel if you start to really think about it um and and so again 40 role playing has some advantages but there are also some real serious drawbacks and and frankly this idea that we should just be able to trust the players that you should just be able to trust your players I don't disagree. Trust them in the sense that you know they're not going to cheat, right? And and the same goes for you as a game master. You shouldn't be cheating either. But trust, I mean, the idea of trusting a player not to add to the narration in a way that you're not comfortable with, you, you, you guys aren't mind readers. You can't read their mind and they can't read yours. And so to no fault of anyone, um, it's very easy for this to kind of unravel or fall apart or go off in a kind of a, um, a bad direction. And then the, the session suffers because you didn't want to have enough control of your own game session. Um, and this idea, well, you know, and I've heard, I've heard the rebuttal to this is, well, just vet your players. The problem is, is that that doesn't work for convention play. That doesn't work for playing at your game store. 
that doesn't work if you even want to grow the hobby and just introduce new people, right? If your idea is that only a certain select elite group of people are going to ever make it to your table, well, guess what? Your table is always going to be a small group of people. You're not going to grow the hobby. You're not going to grow your, you know, the people that you play with. I mean, you know, not that I'm a big D and D fan or even a Gary Gygax fan, but if he had that attitude when he started, you know, doing D and D sessions, no one would have ever got into the hobby at all, right? He had huge groups of people get together at game stores and play with him. Um, and, you know, any and all were welcome, right? I mean, that's that's always, I, I have not seen him play and I wasn't there for the beginning of the hobby in that sense. So everything that I'm saying here is just taking on faith that the things I've, I've read and heard, you know, just stories and accounts about that those things have merit and truth, right? But I, I don't get the impression that he was like vetting people to play in any game that he ran. I, I get the impression that he was making it open and accessible to anyone that was willing to sit down and try a new game system, try a new game. This is all it is. It's just a game. Like you're just trying something new for the first time. Here is how you do it. Let's let's play. Let's figure it out. Let's have fun, right? It, that's the idea. It, it it should be fun. It should be entertaining. And if it's not, then don't do it. Um, but the the more the more you try to be like um, specific and like hammer this down and turn this into something that you have to do this one certain way and if you don't do it then then you're not playing it the right way i i just think you lose people i think i think you turn people off to the hobby and and you make things more difficult than they need to be um and it's just not necessary um, another concern with 4D role playing that you really have to consider is that if you know it's okay to have a, a, a really role play heavy game session, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes that happens, um, especially depending on the system you run. That that may be very much the case. Maybe maybe you only have so many hours to play, and just given the situation that the player characters find themselves in, the first half of that is going to be a lot of heavy role play, and then the second half will be a lot of heavy combat. Um, and and the first session that you do. Um, you only get through the RP part, and then the second session is going. You know, the next session will be a lot of dice rolling. So you may have situations where it kind of breaks up funny or weird like that, where you have a, a role play heavy session. And again, I've done videos on this. You don't have to roll for everything. You only roll for things that are really meaningful, that really matter, that are very important. That the thing is, you should still be rolling. There should still be rolls. And even in sessions that I've had that have been heavy role play, I've had sessions, whole sessions, you know, three, four, five hour sessions where no dice were rolled, and every single time when i reflect back on that that game session i always think to myself i should have thrown in some rolls there should have been some dice rolling at some point because that's part of the game part of this is that it is a game it is not just a role play session it is a role playing game so dice should come into play that your character sheet should come into play um that you know again there's a balance that needs to be had um, you know, there's a fun, there is a fun and, and just really tangible feeling of excitement when you get to roll those dice. And so if you're, if you're eliminating that because you rather focus just on the narration, the problem is that at a certain point you cease to be playing a game. Now you're just sitting around the table telling a collective story. You might as well be around a campfire telling campfire stories. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not a tabletop role-playing game. Um, and, and so there's a balance that needs to be had because otherwise you lose something. You lose part of the game that makes it a game, okay? And you don't want to do that. If you veer too much into just heavy, full, 100% narration, then you end up with a LARP session. That's 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 a different that's a different hobby. That's a different thing, right? Um, and and so you have to be mindful of that. It's important to remember that even though improv plays a role, right? Um, it is not an improv theater session right that's not what a tabletop role playing game is and 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 so there there are most of us in the hobby like rolling dice we like interacting with our character sheets remember your character sheet is that is your hud that is your that is your engagement with the game itself right that's why you've got it in front of you that is how that's your overlay for the game world um that is that is who the player character is that that is your main character your protagonist whatever you want to call them um and so you want to be able to interact with that throughout the game session and you want to be able to roll dice um and 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 then role play fills in everything else and and again i'm on the side where role play should be a majority part of the session but there's a balance that needs to be had between the role play part and the game part um and, and so a, a marriage of those two is, is is really important my problem with a lot of people that are i think talking about this 4d role playing th there's like an elitist mindset that that 
I, I kind of see online. And it's on both sides. This is not a one side or the other thing. Um, it is it is wrong for you to think um, that if you 4D role play, that somehow you're doing role play better than people who 3D or 2D or even 1D. Um, I saw a reaction video that Unscripted Unchained did. And again, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to misrepresent him, but to kind of paraphrase what he said, um, he, he made the comment, he said something like, uh, well, the only one that only one of these that I would have a problem with, you know, 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D would be 1D. And that's that's the one that is is not OK. If someone did that for more than a couple sessions, I would I would, you know, have a conversation with them about leaving the game or getting out of it. Uh, but, it, you know, 2D, 3D, 4D, those are all just uh, just different ways to play that in and of itself is a terribly elitist mindset. Um, you, not everyone at the table needs to be at the same level for everyone to still have fun and be together. It is a mistake to equate 1D players with problem players. Those are not the same thing. I've had 1D players at my table while everyone else was 3D players, and it's never been an issue. It really hasn't. Um, th that player, while they maybe were just there because their friends came that night and they just tagged along with them, maybe they didn't know the rules like everyone else. Uh, maybe they they you know had to have uh, help or questions throughout the game session for what to roll or when to roll, things like that. Um, maybe that they were very passive and they kind of sat back and just kind of made, made a joke here or there or did a little movie quote here or there but otherwise they still followed along you know they they were you know they were there they were there basically just keeping up with the group but even still there were a couple points in those sessions where that player had a good idea or they rolled really great on a roll that they made and then they they did a good job narrating the results of that one particular role and so they still got to be the hero of the night they still got to have a lot of fun at the table they still contributed in a very fun healthy way at the table they were not disruptive they were not a problem child at the game so uh, um, it is wrong to think that just because someone is playing at a lower dimension than you, that it in some way makes you better than them. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. And you shouldn't think that way. Uh, and again, I don't mean any disrespect to Unscripted Unchained, but what he did is the same thing I see other people do that think that 4D role-playing is better than 3D. Um, and again, it's just this idea of some people, they, just, they get this idea in their head that their way of playing is better than everyone else's way of playing. Now, don't get me wrong. There are wrong and right ways to play tabletop role-playing games, but if you play 1D, 2D, 3D, or 4D, that is totally fine. All of these are acceptable ways to play the game, especially considering that none of these, none of this topic has anything to do with rules as written, no matter what game we're talking about, all right? Across the board, we're talking about how you role-play the game at the table, and that's true for any game you play. 4D is not better than 3D, and 3D is not better than 2D, and 2D is not better than 1D. Um, it's just they're just different right it's just different ways to play and all of it is just a game okay and so here here's um there's a point with this you you make that you make this whole subject a chore and a headache when you start trying to overly analyze it and dissect it too much so for instance um, I see online a lot of people trying to turn the word fun into a dirty word where people say well I don't play this game for fun I play it for entertainment okay Again, I mean no disrespect, okay? Um, they're the same thing, guys. What someone does for fun is what they do for entertainment. If you didn't find it fun, it wouldn't be entertaining, right? It's just it's such a weird line that you're trying to draw in the sand when really they're just synonyms, okay? They don't, there's no, there's really no difference, okay? Um, if I didn't have fun doing it, I wouldn't do it because it wouldn't be entertaining to me. I it's the same thing right uh if it's a chore it's not part of entertainment uh not for you okay um the next thing is the the dirty use of the word you i see a lot of people trying to eliminate you from the vocabulary i understand in principle the idea is is that you don't want to narrate the reactions of the characters but also it's just part of common english it's the way we we make sense of how to describe things so again, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's not that you can't describe senses. It's not that you can't use the word you. It's just that you have to use it appropriately, right? Um, you know, don't describe what a player character's actions are and don't describe what their reactions are. But you can certainly describe their senses and you can certainly describe them using the word you and it's totally fine. I don't understand the need to try to be word police. I hate word police. I, I'm, I'm very much anti-censorship and I see too many people online trying to censor words. Well, you said the word you. Oh no, this is terrible. No, it's not. 
No, it's not. Not, not in and of itself. Um, again, you're just you're 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 making it more of a headache than it needs to be. You're 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 putting yourself into a corner where you're like, how do I say this without saying this? I mean, why why make life so difficult for yourself? Just use language in a way that language is meant to be used, and just make sure that you're not stepping on the toes of the players. Right? It's their character, so you don't tell them how they how they react or how they act. But otherwise, sure, absolutely, describe things using the senses and um, and describe things uh, and people with you or you know this person or you because you have to distinguish sometimes. Right? Maybe one person sees something that no one else does. So you have to be able to clearly communicate about what's in the room or what's happening in the scene, because this is all happening in the imagination, the shared imagination of everyone at the table. And so if you're not crystal clear on what that looks like, then you're going to get confusion at your table, especially if you're doing theater of the mind. Again, you can role play any way you want, 4D, 3D, 2D, 1D, whatever, 3D, I think 3D is probably the best way to play because it avoids any issues that you might get into with 4D role-playing. Uh, but 4D role-playing, if you're watching it online, is a lot more fun, okay? Um, so if you're doing it for performances, 4D is the best way to play. Um, and, and, and my table, personally, we do something between 3D and 4D on a regular basis, um, and and I don't I don't and I've, we always have and I don't understand how this is something new or revolutionary or how it can rile so many people up. Um, don't be an elitist. Don't think your way is better than anyone else's. Um, it's not. But I will tell you there are certain ways that are wrong to play tabletop role playing games. So let's address those. Number one, if you're using safety tools at your table, you're playing the game wrong period. There's no excuse to ever use safety tools. If you fudge dice results at your table, you are playing the game wrong, period. There's no reason to cheat. Don't be a cheater, right? Be honest with the other people at the table, whether it's a game master or the players. It's irrelevant. Don't cheat. Don't roll behind a little screen. It's just weird to me. Um, don't do that, right? Roll out in the open. Be honest about what you rolled because it's just a game, right? Act your age. Uh, I can't, people like they roll dice and then they try to lie about what they got and then they want to pretend like that's okay or that's acceptable. No, it's not. It's not okay. That's a terrible way to play the game. It's a terrible way to treat people that you get together to play games with. If you LARP at your game session, you're playing the game wrong. Do not show up to a dang game table dressed up like a fictional character. If I opened the, if I invited someone over to my house to play a tabletop role-playing game and they showed up in knight's armor with a fictional like sword, like a plastic sword, or like some kind of like um, you know Renaissance fair attire. I would have to have the, a real talk with them and be like, dude, like this is not acceptable behavior. Like I invited you into my home and you showed up like a crazy weirdo on Halloween. Like what are you doing? I'm not saying it's wrong to dress up at a Renaissance fair, but this is not a Renaissance fair. It's a tabletop role playing game. And there's a lot of people online that don't know the difference. Um, I see all kinds of channels online that do uh, D and D sessions and everyone that's at the table is wearing a costume. That's not tabletop role playing. That, that's that's some kind of weird, creepy performance where adults are pretending to be children. Um, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't, it's it's not part of the hobby. You you are you are bringing LARPing into this hobby. Those are that's a different hobby. Don't do that. Um, and the other way to play wrong would be robbing player agency, overly narrating what the player characters are doing without player approval, right? Taking over a player character so you can have them do what you want them to do rather than what they wanted to do, what they said they were going to do. Um, overly narrating in general without rolling dice, right? There needs to be some things left to dice results. All right, so these are some thoughts that I had on the subject. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Have a great day.